Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Wednesday. It is the ninth day of November, year of our Lord, 2022. I do pray this finds you well on this beautiful fall day. Enjoy it and enjoy it tomorrow as well because the weather is going to change. I looked Friday. The high is going to be in the 30s, the low is in the 20s, and it's going to be that way for the... Uh, uh, at least for the next 10 days, uh, as far as how, as, as they're willing to try to even try to predict the weather. So uh, get what you need to do done outside. If you need to plant anything or, or uh, dig anything up, you know, the ground is going to freeze fairly quickly in temperatures like that. So just keep that in mind. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Tonight we turn, according to the Daily Lectionary, to the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, verses 1 through 13 of chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, they do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And that is the gospel of the Lord. And that we find, I know I was gone uh, Monday night and Tuesday night, so we skipped over a little bit, but we, we hear this long discourse that Matthew records about the end times. And, and when you read those, you have to read, always read the Word of God carefully, pay attention to the grammar. In particular, he slips back and forth between narrative and apocalyptic literature, uh, an uh, uh, the apocalyptic genre, which becomes very symbolic. And also, it's sort of fascinating what he does with time, talking about things that are going to happen right away, and almost sometimes in the same sense, then talking about things that are going to happen at some time in the future. We are in that time of tribulation. That time began with his ascension, and we'll go on to his return. Uh, the church age, it's also called, it's also symbolically called in Revelation, the, you know, the thousand years. Uh, it's a lot of symbolic numbers in, in, in Revelation. Obviously, it's been much longer than a thousand years. But pay attention as you're reading through these things you know, to what he's saying. And this is also what a prophet is given to do. Jesus, not only being the Son of God, but also being a prophet, has to indicate that he's a prophet or demonstrate that he's a prophet by, by saying things that will happen very quickly and things that will happen, and therefore we know to trust the things that will happen, that he says will happen in the future. True of the Old Testament prophets, in fact, that's one of the tests that God gives us to check prophets. And there's many things that Jesus did and uh, or spoke about that came true very, fairly quickly, uh, very, very quickly. And these things are woven together often in these end times discourses. So we hear, like, no one knows the day and the hour and the abomination of the desolation. And again, you know, he talks about his coming and learning a lesson from the fig tree. And I'm just looking at the headings there where they can be helpful. And then we get to this parable of the ten virgins. So 
The kingdom of heaven, he begins, will be like ten virgins. And remember, the kingdom of heaven is wherever Christ is. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. Now, you pay attention to this parable and you realize, well, what's the difference? We don't know anything about these people other than they're virgins, women, and half are foolish, half are wise. And what is the actual difference? The oil. The wise have it. The unwise do not. And the unwise, the parable indicates to us, were those who had the opportunity, a long opportunity, to go and get the oil so they'd be prepared. And then when the time came where they were going to need the oil, they were not prepared. And the other thing we see in this parable is that when that time comes, whatever happens at that time, it's done. It's done. So we could summarize, we're going to pack it a little bit more with the, with the word, be prepared, be ready. Well, how do you do that? Oil. And that oil means we live lives of repentance. We live lives immersed in God's gift. We come together in the life of the church. We receive the gifts in the place he says it. He says they're going, you, you're going, he's going to be to give them to you. We come to church. We know he is there. That's where he says he's going to be. You don't have to go looking for him. He tells you where he's going to be. And he calls ministers, me in this case, the church, and many like me, uh, many of my, all my brothers in office. And our job is to proclaim Christ and him crucified, to be stewards of the mystery of God, the mysteries of Christ. So we proclaim his holy word. We give you the sense of that word, telling you, you see what this has to do with you, much like I'm doing now. And we, it's called preaching, by the way, and we baptize and we administer the Lord's Supper according to Christ's institution. This is what makes you prepared. You're hearing, you're first of all being fed every week with the Word of God. And the Word of God is, through the mouth of the pastor, is showing you who you are, showing you how you're loved by God, showing you what God has done for you, where your hope lies, why you can have hope and be joyful in all the things we are as Christians, and why we also need, and we hear texts like this, we think, yeah, you know, there are people in our lives, every one of us have people in our lives that, for whatever reason, have stopped coming to church, and, want, you know, not, and those are the real sad ones, you know, you think, I mean, it's always sad, but I think for all of us, it's personally sad, in a very personal way, because these are people we know and love, people are close to us, and they have drifted off. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. Pray, certainly. You know, but you can do things like encourage them to come to church. You, you know, feast days are coming. Lots of them are coming up. Uh, so we're entering the holy time of, of the holy season of the church year. It's called the festival half of the church year. Advent begins very quickly. Thanksgiving Eve and then the following Sunday is Advent. First Sunday in Advent, we'll have the midweek services, children's program, Christmas, which is also on a Sunday this year, Christmas Eve. Uh, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, you know, the uh, the Epiphany, all these opportunities where we can invite people, and they're, they're more willing to come in Christmas. And I always think mothers have this great, great influence still in our day over their sons and daughters. I remember, uh, and I, I think it was a little more prominent in the church I served previously than it was here, though it happens here too, that mothers... You know, their kids ask, what do you want for Mother's Day, Mom? You want to go out for breakfast or something like that? Yeah, I would love to go out for breakfast, you know, the Mother's Day brunch. But I want you to go to church with me. It's Mother's Day. And I would see, you know, children of these moms who hadn't come to church at often in a long time be there in church with moms on that day. So it was important for me to, you know, as it is every Sunday, to talk about Christ. So anyway, that's the oil. These, these gifts that Christ gives us, and you need to be immersed in that. You can't find it anywhere else. You're not going to find it in nature. You, you can't, you, you, that's a cop-out saying I'm spiritual, not religious. That, that's just said by people who don't want to have to deal with facing the truth, the truth of God's word and sharing that word and amending their lives by that word and realizing that we are set apart from the world. It can be very uncomfortable. I realize that. 
you know, but it is the only place where, where we can be and be ready because the time is short and he will come back. Now, um, one thing that I want, to, I want to say to soften this too, because we all have people like this in our families, uh, before I continue with that other thought, is that's all you can do is ask. It's an important thing. Don't neglect that. Most of us are not equipped to get into serious theological debates with people about things. I don't know how helpful that is, even for me. Um, if, if people want to engage, I am happy to do that on a, with a couple of conditions. There are people who I engage with who just are, you know, no matter what, they're right and you're wrong. And there's no point in wasting my time having a conversation with that. They're not being reasonable. I can invite them to church. I can say, I disagree with you, but we obviously can't have a conversation about this. And that's all you can do. And remember, God uses other people than you and other things other than you and people. He's God. You know, he doesn't need you, uh, but he wants to use you. Anyway, you know, but that's all you can do. You're not dragging people to the church like grown children. We can't, you know, force them to get in the car while the door is shut. And, get, and that would, that's not helpful. I mean, that's not how it works. But that's all you can do with these people in your life and say, geez, I'd love you to come. You know, and, and it makes me sad. I, you know, I have those words come out of my mouth. You know, it makes me sad that I don't see you there. It makes me sad as a pastor to people that I know um, that aren't my flesh and blood, aren't my family, and my immediate family, or in a very close circle of friends. It makes me sad, and it should make all of us sad. But it also uh, makes me very sad when it's people of my own family, who, and we all have people like that in our lives. Anyway. Keep this in mind. And that's something, you know, when you're having those conversations with people about these things, like, you know, the time is short, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with ask people, asking people, you know, well, what do you actually believe? And if they believe it's all a bunch of nonsense, again, that's where you get into a debate and dialogue. And if you're not equipped to do that, or it's not the time to do that, then don't. Okay, uh, uh, you'll, you'll often make things a little bit worse if you just sort of guess and stab around at things, then know what you're talking about. Because uh, people remember that. They remember that you didn't know what you're talking about, and, and it doesn't make you sound uh, like somebody that somebody should listen to. You can always have them talk to me. That's very intimidating for people. You know, why don't you come talk to my pastor? The best way to have that happen is say, you know, you should come to church and, and hear the way we preach in our church. Not me, not that I'm any special thing in that regard, but just how we proclaim Christ and him crucified. As I mentioned, I think it was the last time I did this broadcast, which was Sunday night. I, I remember, I think that was the day I mentioned that young couple, the, uh, and I, gosh, I can't remember the young woman's name. She had been a surfer and still is a surfer, lost her arm in a shark attack, very Christian woman. But there was a podcast, which I shared on our Facebook page, uh, through issues, etc about her and her husband coming to Lutheranism. And the thing I pointed out then, which I'm going to point about now, is one of the things that blew them away about Lutheranism was how much scripture is read in church. So, you know, that's you know, that's one of the reasons we always want to be asked people to come to church, because God promises to work through his word. He promises that his word will not return empty. And so that's why Satan doesn't want us to go there. Once it's oh, you you know, wants us to think we can experience God anywhere. Or I'm just tired of all those rules. I hear that one a lot. You know, I'm just, especially now, you know, um, uh, one, one thing I wanted to say, you know, so finishing up this parable, remember, I guess the take home points are the oil. That's the difference. You either have it or you don't. Uh, so we, we have it because we're immersed in the life of God. We're in the place where he's called us to be, to receive his gifts. You don't have to, there's no looking in your heart. There's nothing about that here. You know, these people are holier. These people are less holy. There's one is prepared and one isn't. It's the oil that makes them prepared. Right? And then once the time comes, it's done. You know, whether that's your death or he comes back, second coming, he comes back to judge the earth. Now, just very briefly, <sighs> the elections. Um, you know, first of all, uh, God's in charge. Now, uh, um, I live in a very, I don't know if anybody, if everybody who listens to this is in Illinois or not, I don't, you know, there's a few people listening to it. It's a very blue state. I know some of the people who listen to this 
are also in very blue states where where the governments and often your neighbors are very hostile to the faith and increasingly that's you know that's illinois uh and um and that often makes it difficult for people in the church to hold jobs and stuff like that but god is in charge right he is in charge now that is comforting and also terrifying uh comforting from the standpoint is like okay you know he's still running the show you know christmas is still going to come uh and he'll never not be running the show he allows these things to happen you know or even ordains them to happen for his will for his purposes uh and, and all we can do is say you know what are we doing he uses these things to call us to repentance i think in my opinion not knowing that you know personal will of god that he is calling us to repentance i mean we're becoming an increasingly godless nation in my former state of michigan uh in california california codified in their constitution the right to kill a baby in his mother's womb it's now a right um uh, and this these aren't meant to be apologetics classes these but one thing i want to say about that about rights um the only rights we have are the rights you know to die as we stand before god that's what we deserve uh we're born uh, we do have the right to be called children of god by christ and and uh it's talked about by that but ask yourself this or when you get into dialogues people about this where do rights come from what makes a right good or bad if it's simply the popular will of the people that's a little literal dead end as we see with this issue of abortion but also if if there isn't a standard that's outside of us then meaning god's commandments that are written on our hearts and woven in the fabric of creation god if there isn't a standard that's outside of us uh, then then there's no basis on which to say some behavior is right and some behavior is wrong and it cannot just be the will of the people this is why we have a democratic republic and not a strict democracy because our our founding uh, fathers were smart enough to realize and they knew enough about human nature the depravity of man that's in all of us to realize that yes you know you just can't have direct power put in the hands of people because people are fallen and you can't have the word we like to use mob rule so the idea was that you'd have people in office that were wise enough even though when the democracy the democracy might say we want to do this that you would have people that would be wise enough and you had all the checks and balances of 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 the system the three you know the three branches of government which are of course greatly eroded in our time those things were to you know there would be a wisdom there hopefully to say yeah i realize that people want to do this but this is not a good thing and sometimes it's failed but usually with time it, it's found a way to correct itself and so you can take an issue like slavery you know slavery one of the impetuses behind slavery in the united states it, the uh um uh, much and this is contrary to what we heard from one of our previous presidents uh you know that oh you know he had a real bee in his bonnet about you know christian church in america and there's some things that certainly we could say there one of the things he would never mention was that the drive to eliminate Christ, to eliminate slavery came from the church came from the church um and, and people understood that you know having another human being in bondage is not something that is ultimately pleasing to god and wherever christianity has taken hold slavery has died out all many of the social services that we have information is are are all from the influence of christianity so anyway the point is when we rights and even just the discussion of good versus evil you know what's good and what's evil can't be based on our opinions it isn't based on our opinions it gets perverted and twisted by the fall in our opinions but ultimately it's something that's outside of us that we look to and say well we've gone we've gone astray here and that's what we need to do now is as a nation look and say 
wow, we've really, we're, we've really gone astray. Now we're not a theocracy, meaning we're not, this is not a nation that we're, we're a, you know, a, a theological figure, like one of the judges of old, of the Old Testament, or, or God himself leads us, and God is leading us, but not directly or immediately. He's using, you know, he works behind the scenes. It's frustrating for us at times, but he does, he is working. So anyway, not to belabor this point, God is in charge. Okay, now it's wonderful because, okay, yeah, yeah, he's, he's got this. But the other side of the coin is, you know, he will do what it takes to keep our eyes fixed on him, including, you know, painful things that call us to repentance. And Hosea, uh, you know, just, just read the 12 minor prophets, you know, and Jeremiah, which is the Old Testament reading uh, for the daily election that we're in right now. You know, and it's like, oh, you know, oh, whoa, <laughs> you know, and, uh, um, but he does that to wake us up. And it's painful. It's painful when it happens, uh, even for God's people, even for the faithful. Uh, so it's something that we can all pray for and use our voices in our community for. Um, anyway, just wanted to say something about that. Um, it's all on our minds, you know, and uh, it's God's people. It's like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? Uh, but God is in charge, Okay. Um, use your voice in whatever way God gives you to use it. Uh, certainly we all voted, hopefully, and uh, uh, you pray, 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 you know, for our leaders and our nation and our communities. Okay. Let's now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father, Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, in a community, a state, a nation that is so confused about marriage, families, and the roles of husbands and wives and parents and children, may we look to your holy word, seek your wisdom, and uphold what you would have us do, and live and honor and proclaim in our communities by what we say and what we do, your ordered harmony, which you have given us, and proclaim the great blessings that are found there, as we live in this broken and fallen world, we as always pray for parents who must raise their children alone, strengthen them, keep them from falling into loneliness and despair, help them find joy in their difficult vocation, and be with us, their brothers and sisters, that we may reach out to them and help them uh, as you have given us the ability to do so. May we as your people be a blessing to our communities and neighborhoods, and may the love of Christ shine through them. Heavenly Father, as always, we pray for those who are crying out to you. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, Leonard, Maxine, Jane, Stacy, Dennis, Dave, Sandy, and Dawn. For my brothers in office, Mike and Dale. For dear friends of our congregation, Dawn, Ron, Heather, Russ, Phil, Joan, Dave, Anita, Katie, John, Bert, William, Joe, Jason, D, Marge, Dylan, Josiah, Jeff, Jason, Bob, Ashley, Christy, Camden, Esther. Heavenly Father, place your hand upon them. Be with those who care for them and keep them ever mindful of your love, love manifest in Christ our Lord. We pray that you would bless our nation with wise and uh, capable leaders that are eager to do your will. May we as citizens, uh, your people, 
go forth with the love of Christ, being your light and your salt in our communities in various vocations. We ask you to bless uh, mothers with children, especially uh, Lene and Benjamin. Heavenly Father, all these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to sing a hymn written for that reading. Uh, many of you will know this quite well. Uh, Wacht auf um, is the German name, written by Philip Nicolai, who uh, went to be with the Lord in 1608. Wake, awake, for night is flying. Wake, awake, for night is flying. The watchmen on their heights are crying. Awake, Jerusalem, arise. Midnight hears the welcome voices, and at the thrilling cry rejoices. Oh, where are ye, ye virgins wise? The bridegroom comes awake, your lamps with gladness take, alleluia. With bridal care, yourselves prepare to meet the bridegroom who is near. That stands one of that wonderful hymn, 516, Wake, Awake, for Night is Flying. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a pleasant evening, a blessed rest. And by God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.